Hey kids, this week Indiana is all about WWE and the Lazy River of Forbidden Door Preview and Invader Club, Kawada versus Albright. Do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling too. This is Shake Them Rubs. I am Jeff Hawkins, experimenting with the open yet again. <laughs> he is Chris Novembrino. I'm experimenting with marijuana yet again. <laughs> I got to tell you, this... We this, get flagged a little bit for that, but that's okay. <laughs> this, this is very promising. I think this is working out oh, is, good. It, is this getting yeah. you through the week? Yeah. yeah I, <laughs> it's really keeping my head calm. Oh. <laughs> uh, maybe I just need... Maybe I just need to, like, pour myself a stiff drink and just, just somehow try and make it through the show. <laughs> Wait, who's flagging us? Oh, uh, YouTube. Oh, YouTube. Oh, when, yeah. when well, it kind of watches you smoke, it's like, oh, we got to flag that. Okay, cool, whatever. Usually, uh, it's not that bad, but, you know, whatever. You you ruined my bit, by the way, because you came in with a Vader Club reference. I didn't think you were going to have one. No. I, and I was going to tell the people how much you don't care about them. I was going to bury you. This sucks. No, they, <laughs> I, it's better than this. This is extremely on brand. I am the kid who showed up to class with the project that he pulled together in the last 10 minutes on the bus and got a B plus. <laughs> it's like my thesis. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, because it was like, I ask you all week, give me a Vader club suggestion. Give me a Vader club suggestion. Give me a Vader. Please, for the love of God, Chris, I've hated all this wrestling this week. Give me a Vader club suggestion. And you're just like, ah, you know, hey, let's let's go in 15 minutes if you can. It's like, no, I can't. I'm at work, Chris. <laughs> And give me a Vader Club suggestion so I can watch it at lunch. No, and then, I'm and not going to do that. And then finally came to me. I, I, <laughs> it, it's tough because it's like, all right, we've done Shamrock. I've done Vader. I, I've got a few other ones up my sleeve, but like, I didn't feel like pulling the Muda match or something yet. Uh, and so I wanted to get someone who it was always been like a mainstay on my VPW two cartridge. And I've had a million matches with in virtual reality, but I've only watched a handful of matches in reality of, and that's scary Albright. And uh, yeah, I, I know, I know so everywhere. little about him. So this will be fun. Uh, but we gotta, we gotta pay attention to some little uh, downer of a bit of news. Uh, Sika, the wild Samoans passing away this week, uh, AKA Roman Reigns, father. Uh, one half of Afa and Sika, of course, the Wild Samoans. Uh, big time team in the 70s and 80s. I came to them relatively late because my WWF uh, fandom, because, you know, you couldn't get WWF unless you had cable where I was. So that was mostly the mid 80s. And by then he had, uh, I'm reading now from um, Wrestling Observer, Sika returned as a singles wrestler in August 1986. Managed by the Wizard, a.k.a. King Curtis Iakea, and later Mr. Fuji, and often teaming with Kamala. God, I remember that. That team ended when Kamala quit. He was introduced coming out of the ocean with a large fish in his mouth and started eating the raw fish, although mostly chewed and spit it out. Thank you, Dave. But yes, I remember that bit. And then uh, here's another one. I just, if, if you want to really go read in depth and serious, go read Dave Meltzer's obituary of him. He always does a great job with obituaries. He basically, everything from almost his birth to like five minutes before he died. And that's a, that's a Dave Meltzer obituary in the wrestling observer. But, uh, Sika was a kind of enforcer type famously roughing up bam, bam Bigelow. When the feeling was that Bigelow was getting too cocky. He was a veteran heel, but at this stage of the game is mostly there to put over the top baby faces. He left the company after WrestleMania four on March 27th, 1988. Man, there's a guy that I'm glad finally had a career in the mid to late 90s. It's Bam Bam Bigelow because he goes to WWF. He gets he gets roughed up by Sika, and then he go, jumps to the NWA. He jumps to Crockett and flares on camera, calling him fat boy and saying, oh, yeah, you don't, uh, you know, we, we don't wrestle like those wussies up there <laughs> north and stuff. I mean, Bam Bam Bigelow was just getting it from all ends but uh back and he to... was awesome in his own oh yeah. Yeah, oh yeah he absolutely had like the look at the <laughs> menace and totally worked as a top level heel but but not to uh not to uh <laughs> not to go off on too much of a tangent uh do you have any remembrances of the wild samoans not, or... not, per not particularly they were yeah. a little bit before my time like like they it, and they were always a 
middle of the card sort of thing. Like, you know, they, they, they... I believe Lou Albano also. Right. Made... Right. Yeah. Like, I, I'm familiar with them as an act, but, uh, I feel like I watched them have, you know, a match against the Bushwhackers, I'm sure. Oh, maybe but... in that later stage. Or, or, yeah, yeah might right. be, or, or yeah, when they were, like, like mixing them up. Or, but, but, I mean, the original, like, Afa and Sika were on their way out when I was getting into it. And that's when they had the British Bulldogs and the Hart Foundation were just coming in and, and all those other great tag teams. And I always kind of thought, eh, you know, they're great, but they're a little bit up there or whatever. But uh, Right. I mean, for me, like the sort of quintessential Samoan tag team still sort of remains the faces of fear. Like Meng <laughs> and the Barbarian, even though, like, you know, the, the Samoan lineage, they just sort of did it, that gimmick, I think no one did it better than those two. Right, but often Seeker are probably yeah. the blueprint for the gimmick. You know, mm -hmm. the two guys, and yeah, you know, the jingoistic, we found these two savages in the wilds of Samoa, and they're, you know, headhunters, and they do cannibalism, and, and all these other things. And then and then from there, they begat, like, the Samoan SWAT team, and uh, Yokozuna, when he was known in world-class championship wrestling as uh, Coquinas Maximus, you know, that giant guy, you know, the Samoan Savage, and the Islanders even, you know, Haku and Tama, and later the Tonga Kid, and, and then, of course, you know, the Usos and Rikishi and, 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 and now Samu and Tonga, Fatu and all Tonga those. Loa, Tal Loa, Longa Loa, Hong Konga Loa. <laughs> yes. Uh, also passing away this week, Jamie Kellner, whose career included being part of the creation of both the Fox and WB broadcast networks, but who also changed the history of wrestling as a guy who essentially led to the pulling the plug on WCW. If you've been watching the death of WCW on Vice, that terrible program, as I described it, death of WCW on Vice is like murder on the Orient Express. If everybody, if each of the of the uh, suspects slash murderers had a podcast, because that's what it is. Uh, <laughs> it's, if you took murder on the Orient Express and combined it with Rashomon and then hit it with a shuffle to make it much dumber than either of those <laughs> yes. two things. Yes, I just, I, I just like everybody's blaming Keller. It's like giving these, you know, it gave Eric Bischoff like a redemption arc. I'm like, get out of here with that crap. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm not watching it. But uh, Keller was hired to replace Ted Turner at the start of March 2001, just over two months after Turner Broadcasting had announced a sale of WCW to Fusion Media a company that was put together to take over the company by both Eric Bischoff and Brian Bedall, and that, of course, fell through. Kellner's power would be all over programming on TBS, TNT, the WB, CNN, the Cartoon Network, TNT Sports, as well as overseeing the Atlanta Braves, Atlanta Hawks, and Atlanta Thrashers. Kellner's decision publicly was the idea that they felt wrestling didn't attract affluent enough viewers. Jim Weiss at TBS said about the decision, quote, basically we've decided that professional wrestling in its current incarnation is not consistent with the upscale brands we've built at TNT and TBS. Therefore, we will not be carrying it. This was when basically TBS and TNT totally, re when they sold the AOL, they totally revamped their network images because TBS was the most hillbilly network. Right. You could Like Andy Griffith played on that, thing like 20 times a day like if there was I mean, a rain delay for the whole, braves like, starting five minutes late was weird and rednecky and pastoral well th yeah but that was to uh that was for ratings reasons yeah but even that was like their own thing now yeah know? and that was individualistic yeah that was that was them yeah. being contrarian in their own way 605 eastern on the super station yes type of a thing but turner was always the you know wrestling turner always thought yeah, wrestling built this network, so we should always have wrestling on this network. And Jamie Kelmer, Kellner came in there and goes, no, 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 we want the upscale clientele. We're going to play Surviving the Game 20 times in one weekend on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yeah, they'd be doing stuff like that. And they had, the, they, had the, uh, they had Thursday Night Football. They had the NBA at that time because TNT was really the first network other other than broadcast to carry on cable to carry the NBA for for any length of time and at that time they were playing like Marx Brothers movies before they'd play at like an like a West Coast game or something it was it was a total revamp it was a revamp to get into the 90s slash early aughts and, and you know and in a bizarre era in advertisement where the conventional advertising wisdom was that lower class people don't buy stuff. 
<laughs> so how could you possibly sell that? Those, there those aren't poor don't that, have money. The hell with besides them. that. There aren't even that many of them. So how could you possibly sell things? These are not the Glen Gary leads I was told about. No, yeah, it, it it's. Uh, oh, what was I gonna say? Because there, there's something weird. I mean, yeah, it's always like everybody, everybody does this though. Oh, we don't we don't th want those common folks coming in here. That, that's all LA real estate is is based on. There's no like real affordable apartment complex. That, oh, we want the upscale people with the money. Real, you know, young Hollywood will come here and rent this place for six thousand dollars a month because it has a view of the Hollywood sign or something. And it's like no. <laughs> Everybody should just have more money. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, I don't blame Keller. I mean, if you watched WCW at that time, WCW also sucked. This was I, like new th blood this versus not a the company millionaires. that was going to be saved by a yes. new ownership team. Like, even if Bischoff and his partner had managed to pull off the deal with Fusiant, they still had a very crappy show that had in a brand that was brutally damaged by the finger poke of doom and Vince Russo coming out and announcing a page one reset of the entire history yes. of the company. Yeah. I mean, like there have been so many things that had taken WCW from a, you know, not a prestige brand in the early 90s because it certainly wasn't, but from a brand where it was relevant 96, 97, 98 to being something that was as irrelevant as it was in the early 90s, if not more so. Yeah, I I, I just, it's like, uh, all these things about, you know, Bischoff could have saved WCW. Bischoff was all in on Hogan still. As as the uh, as, as the savior of wrestling because you know well look at the ratings or whatever man people had uh... <laughs> dude if he had understood what utility Hollywood Hulk Hogan brought to WCW and had utilized the Hollywood Hulk Hogan character to its logical conclusion Starcade of 1997 and then basically sent Hogan packing after this one last very long title reign, thus leaving the belt to Sting and really setting up the new Sting era or whatever. That would have been one thing, but he never understood what the limits of Hulk Hogan was well, as a character. I'm, I'm going to, because like in the early night or in like 94, I think is when they signed Hogan. <clears throat> People in WCW were still very, loyal to the kind of Crockett brand of wrestling and okay, whatever. And then we have this invasion angle that starts in 95 with, uh, with, with the NWO type thing, 96, 96. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, it's, it, it's all a blur. <laughs> no, it, it, but yeah, it's, it's summer of 96 summer it's, 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 because 95, yeah. they, they had, they had basically exhausted the, the Vince McMahon, template of hogan in wcw hogan was booed. he was already getting hogan booed. they sacrificed the horsemen to hogan vader. all of them they sacrificed the dungeon of doom to hogan and they sacrificed vader to hogan and so we get this nwo thing and the answer to that is to have wcw finally get rid of hulk hogan that's the answer that's how you get the company back is, is you you basically say, yes, we are superior to WWF as opposed to this faux WWF that we have here. And they never could get that through their thick effing skulls. I, I just could not believe that. Then, and then it just became offshoots of NWO and, and we're gonna give the NWO their own show. It's just I, like, what? There is totally an alternative universe where Vader comes back like rebranded as the Mastodon <laughs> on a motorcycle and like starts just beating up the NWO week after week on his crusade to get the title back from Hogan and take the company back. Like after everyone else is felled, here comes Vader. You know, at, maybe after like Hennig turns on the horseman, then Vader becomes like the actual fourth horseman and comes back and takes Arn's spot and kills some dudes. I'm here for that. <sighs> Anyways, also, I'm here for Ric Flair managing Vader. That actually would be <laughs> that cool. actually would be awesome to be honest with you. Uh, WWE getting into the Indiana business. 
officially announced its multi-year deal with Indiana Sports Corporation that will bring one WrestleMania, one SummerSlam, and one Royal Rumble to Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. The official first date of the deal is the 2025 Royal Rumble on February 1st, but the WrestleMania and SummerSlam events will be two nights, so whether the first two-day SummerSlam is in 2025 or 2026, already announced as a two-day event in Minneapolis, this, sh- this does show the plan is two nights for both shows going forward. Meh. The deal which runs from 2025 to 2032 is not just for the three events, as the state will be paying WWE to run Raw, SmackDown, NXT, and other live events as part of the deal in both Indianapolis as well as throughout the state of Indiana, including regular shows in Fort Wayne and Evansville. Hawkins, Crank, Brockway, Ogdenville, and North Haverbrook have not been booked quite yet, but... uh, yeah, it looks like uh, it looks like this whole plan by TKO to have people pay for you to come to them, Indiana, and Indianapolis, which is possibly the most boring metro area in America. Good steakhouses, not much else. Uh, but yeah, what do you think of uh, Indiana getting into WWE business, Chris? So upon seeing the announcement, the first thing that came to mind was a quote from Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy. (laughs) And it is, to paraphrase it, they say that God lives inside of all of us. And if he does, I hope he likes burritos because that's what he's going to get. And that is how I feel about Indianapolis and wrestling. I hope they like it because that is what they are going to get and a lot of it. (laughs) On one level, I think that WrestleMania for Indianapolis is probably a quality investment for the city. That having people like international tourists on that scale probably is more or less unheard of for Indianapolis other than race fans. And this will give them something else. Also, you have race fans there and there's definitely a cross section of car enthusiasts, motorsports enthusiasts and wrestling enthusiasts. So I think that there is uh, some utility in this. But that being said, Indiana is not a particularly populous state. So as you're quipping with the Simpsons references from the monorail (laughs) episode, we are talking about East Podunk, North Haberbrook, uh, Northampton too. Uh, They ran out of names. So they just, you know, who's getting very angry right now, by the way, Chris is Rob McCarran, who's from Indiana. (laughs) Like, look, uh, (laughs) he can go out into a cornfield and scream. (laughs) I hear that's what they do out there when they get angry or sad. NXT in Gary, Indiana, gang capital of America. Right. (laughs) Gary, Indiana. uh, Yes. One of the worst, most declining cities of the country. I think there's a lot of economic opportunity in Indiana. (laughs) Uh, and by opportunity, I mean crisis, and that sometimes crisis is just an, an opportunity in disguise if you really think about it. One of the strangest stories was the announcement of a combined dynamite and collision taping on August 21st in Cardiff, Wales at the Utilita Arena. They had pushed that Wembley Stadium would be the only show of the year in Europe until last week when this show was announced. The strange thing is that while the show was announced by the company in social media, it was never announced on television and pre-sale tickets were put on sale this week. One reader who lives in the area, this is from the Observer, of course, noted to us that he had no idea there was even a show until he saw social media posts complaining about how high the tickets prices are. AEW doing AEW things, Chris. I think... uh... I think that AEW uh, has a very interesting way of booking and promoting their shows. And uh, I I was actually thinking about that a lot as I was watching this week's episode of Dynamite. So I don't want to get too into my review here, but Dynamite was sure interesting on that front too. They have a weird way of getting you excited for what they're doing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you're getting excited for something they're doing. It's just not the thing you're supposed to be getting excited about. 
That's for next week. Uh, let's see. What's next? Uh, John Swicotta, I think is how you say the name, has replaced Ryan Callahan as head writer of SmackDown. Callahan, who had been head writer for the show since 2020, has left the company. Uh, we're, uh, we're told that Callahan was considered a very talented writer, but wasn't as well liked as the leader of the group. I can confirm he took heat for Jennifer Pepperman leaving. Although I think her leaving is more Mercedes Monet got her into AEW. This is Dave, uh, editorializing. It was also said it became harder for underneath talent to reach him. Um, uh, I, I was told by somebody else that, uh, Triple H didn't quite care for Ryan Callahan either. And uh, there were a few uh, writers who have had some issues with one Ryan Callahan. Um, interesting, though, because they're on their hottest streak, and th- this, the, this past four years of SmackDown have been quite good. And so I'm a little... Like, I get getting along to get along, and I don't know that I don't know anything about this, to be honest with you, so I'm kind of talking out of my butt, to be honest with you, but I'm also a don't-change-horses-if-things-are-working type of person. Totally. I mean, the one thing, and again, we're not there, so I don't know, but the one thing that does make me think that maybe this was a necessary departure is that he had seeming dislike from above and below. Yeah. And yeah. and that makes you a bad adjunct then, sort of definitionally. Yeah, you're kind of getting it both ways. Uh, Dijak announced he's leaving WWE. Uh, in a social media post, posted a long letter about how, you know, people in the company were telling him he was killing it in NXT, and then he was brought up to the draft. And then he was never used. And then he was never heard from anybody until he heard that his contract was running out from Sean Ross Sapp. Uh, I like Dijak a lot. I hope he kills it. Um, might actually appear on this forbidden door, because I don't think he has a no compete. Now that his contract has run out, but uh, he would be really useful on AEW television because they need a big man who is formidable, who can talk, who yes. is a presence, and he, with proper presentation, could be elevated to the level of going up against a Swerve Strickland and deliver the kind of match that you would need to merit that. Do some quick hits here, see if anything catches your ear. Baron Corbin has asked Shinsuke Nakamura to corner him for a July 26th jiu-jitsu tournament. Nakamura will be in the corner of flyweight fighter Ray Suriya Suri- Suri- at, the, at the upcoming UFC 303 event in Las Vegas on June 29th. Two Cold Scorpio, real name Charles Skaggs, was arrested on June 15th after an incident where he was working in security where he allegedly stabbed a man. His bookings in Japan for GCW and DDT have been canceled. If you want to talk about that, I can give you more info. MLW company is doing production upgrades. Hires our old friend Dave Marquez as the head of production. Rhea Ripley and Buddy Matthews got married this past week. And uh, any of those catch your ear. I can give you a little bit of background on any on some of them, I think. Uh, I mean... What is, two, I, I... what is Two Cold Scorpio doing working as a security guard in a... He's working at a at a Love's truck stop slash uh <laughs> slash uh convenience store gas right. station. I, I mean, I especially being out here in Albuquerque near uh, an area known as the war zone, uh I know what those type of jobs are. Man, that sucks that he at his age is having to work doing one of those types of jobs because the type of customers that are hitting those places are being frank, the type of customers you want to have defensive protection up to and including a knife for. Yeah. And so I I definitely want to reserve judgment on Scorpio until I know more details about the incident or whatever, uh, because it may very well be a scenario where, yeah, he brandished a knife, uh, but he also reasonably thought that he was in a self-defense situation. Yeah, they, 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 there's a whole write-up of the fight, and he'd ask the guy to put a cigarette out, and the guy started cussing at him, and they took it outside, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We'll see what happens there. Uh, numbers this week. SmackDown on June 25th, or June 21st, a show that we raved about, did its best number since the week after WrestleMania, 2,336,000 and a .73 in 18 to 49. Dynamite on June 26 did another low number, number, but up from last week. 
Still the second lowest in 18 to 49 for the year. The show did 680,000 with a .22 in 18 to 49. NXT, the garbage show, did 611,000 viewers with a .18 in 18 to 49. Raw doing 1,814,000 viewers, the .61. I mean, I think it's good that AEW doesn't seem to be on the start of a 500,000 viewer sort of yeah. trend for dynamite. So I, last week had to give some uh, flutters of the heart to people who uh, want this show to be long-term successful in, internally, at least. And it seems as though that day has not arrived yet. So that's a good thing. But we'll talk about this AEW Dynamite because, uh, you know, you can't – you're either going up or you're going down when it comes to television. There's, real, like, long, long, long-running products, like 10-year-plus products, settle in at a certain rating viewership, and they've completely plateaued out. The networks expect that. The viewers expect that there's just like basically a base level of viewership that you can kind of have like the people's court or uh, judge Judy judge Judy is never going to go on a serious ratings run, nor is it going to <laughs> let, you know, you don't have to worry about that with judge Judy, but it's also not going to crap out. AEW is still like in television terms, a young program and you have to think if you're not going up, you're going down. And last week's number was maybe indicative of downward motion that they really don't need to be dancing with. Judge Judy is no hot bench. Three judges, one verdict, hot bench. No, uh, <laughs> speaking of this dynamite, let's get into it. This is the lazy river of wrestling criticism. Whatever we watched, whatever we saw over the course of the week, we do have a forbidden door preview but let's talk a little bit about this dynamite real quick here, Chris. And I, I have a, a mini rant in me, if, if, if you do not mind. Oh, please, go ahead. Dear AEW, please learn the art of the hard sell. I know that over years of WWE programming that we've been, we've been kind of conditioned to really hate the amount of repetition and the amount of just flagrant plugging of things from WWE. That does not mean that we want you to do the exact opposite, which is we're going to book for Beach Blast next week in our opening segment of the show. And then to help plug Forbidden Door, what we're going to do is we're going to put on a bunch of B-list New Japan acts that are going to be appearing within Collision or our pre-show or Rampage that nobody gives a crap about. I want to hear the card from top to bottom. I want you to tell me to buy the pay-per-view. I want you to tell me how to buy the pay-per-view on TV. I want you to try and take my money for the love of God. because And I want you to make these feuds feel important instead of, oh, I don't know, doing a 15-minute Kyle O'Reilly versus Zack Sabre Jr. grappling match in the middle of a damn show. It's a fine wrestling match. I get that you're booking for the sickos. I don't care. I want you to build the feuds. I, they started with a 30-minute segment with, with Daniel Garcia, who's not going to win one of these titles, I don't think, in his hometown of Buffalo, teasing that he's going to be in Wembley or that he might win the international title when he's probably not going to win either and he's going to be right back where he started from. Who? Not, not, I like Daniel Garcia. I think the dancing is stupid, but it's gotten him over. I just, in, unless they're going to belt him next week, which, oh, they might. But the excuse I was giving was, well, you see, Will Ospreay will have too much on his plate and he'll be worn out and then Daniel Garcia can beat him. Well, that's not really what you would call a strong win. Now, is it? <laughs> Where he's making an excuse? If you want to push Daniel Garcia, please push Daniel Garcia. Push him to the moon. Have him beat somebody strong clean. We'll get to more about this when I talk about NXT booking, which is absolutely preposterous. Let's but... say a Will Ospreay if we can. Okay, please. So, Will Ospreay 
is doing too much seems to be the story of the show right now. In, in so far as I understand Will Ospreay's character, he's not focused. And that is the story that we're getting. He's focused on MJF. He's focused on Swerve. He's focused on Daniel Garcia. He's focused on having Don Callis, the worst human being in the world, as his friend still. He's focused on a number of different things. Okay, I'll go with that as the story. I, If that is the story, then my question to whomever is, why then do I give a shit about him having a match against Swerve Strickland when we have already written the fate accompli that Will Ospreay is going to lose this match to Swerve Strickland because he's not paying attention? Or, worse still, he beats Swerve Strickland with the overarching story that he was barely even focused on this guy as he was going in, looking past him to going into a match with Daniel Garcia. And, and, and But if the story is not that Will Ospreay is spreading himself too thin, that he is not paying attention and not having his eyes on the prize – then I, I guess there becomes another series of questions downstream from that. Like, what the hell then are you doing with the characterization of Will Ospreay? Or do you not know that you're using the same character in multiple scenes? That you write a scene and you go, oh, I don't know who should be in here. Who's talking to Daniel Garcia? Ah, uh, Will Ospreay. I love Will Ospreay. Have him go down and talk to MJF. <laughs> Well, Will Ospreay and MJF are are going to probably be at at Wembley. That's probably going to be the match. And they're using but they're using Daniel Garcia in his hometown as a plot device, which I'm is go, I, I'm also going to go to the meta point here. In okay. focusing on so many matches with Will Ospreay that he's going to be having, do I really care about any of them? Yeah, and here here's the other thing to your point. He focuses, but you know when he focuses when it's time to use the Tiger Driver 95 or whatever it is. And, oh, yeah, I almost hurt somebody in this match. All of a sudden now, all my focus is on not using this one move, which will cause – because that's why he's going to lose. He's going to lose because he refuses to use his one move type of a yeah. thing, which, I, I mean, I get it as a story. I just I, – I sort of agree. But the other big problem here, too, is that by having all these matches already mapped out for the future, you're telling me that none of these matches are going to result in meaningful feuds. Yes. Not right now. Yes. They, they, they will be set up for set up matches later or something like that. I, I just, th this dynamite to me felt a little desperate. Like the whole bringing out MJ, put over Daniel Garcia when you know he's not winning any of these matches, I don't think. But it felt like a, hey, we push our young stars and I'm going to give a big pep talk right here that's really kind of a meta thing about AEW versus WWE. And then, and then I'm going to proceed to have two hours of Gabe Kidd and Robbie Eagles and Tomohiro Ishii and and even though I like him, the murder grandpa and, and just all all every single backbencher New Japan guy is going to appear on this show when nobody gives a damn about them and you should be focusing in on this forbidden door card. I just, it, 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 it frustrated me to no end, Chris. Uh, yeah. I Tony Storm and Mariah May have go away heat. Don't care about this program in the slightest. At this I point. liked it. I mean, it was it was part. Of, it was it was a nice. You know, look. If we're grading on a curve, that was possibly the best segment in terms of building of building to the pay per view match that we had on I this show. I just hate the story so much. But most importantly, I'm done with the timeless Tony Storm. Well, who are we rooting for in this match? That's I have the question. No idea. Yeah. Yeah. And that becomes a recurring problem on this show, too. So at the end of all-time classic Jay White versus Phoenix, great utilization of Jay White yet again <laughs> on this show, big premier signing of him, <laughs> out comes Christian. Now, what is the point in building heel equity, as in building acquired hatred for a character? If I can dissipate all of it within one week because I'm putting my audience into an ambiguous booking situation where they don't know what the hell to feel about any of this stuff. Out comes Christian and the crowd 
flummoxed, flustered, baffled. How do I feel about Christian versus how do I feel about the Bullet Club Gold? Well, and I guess the thought process was I'm trying to understand the AEW fan base better. It's an exercise in empathy that I remain committed to on a weekly basis, Jeffrey. Uh, what I can only think <laughs> is that in the fans' heads there live, they looked at Austin and Colton Gunn. They're like, ooh, those guys, they're bad to their fathers. I don't like that. And then out comes <laughs> Christian. And Christian is a guy who is a father, uh, sort of. It doesn't really matter. He at least thinks fathers are good, whereas Austin and Colton Gunn, they think fathers are bad. And so the fans have now decided that Christian, guy who's basically been a heel ever since the Kenny Omega feud, like – three years ago yes it is a baby face all of a sudden and the booking of the show allowed for this mistake and i'm going to call it that because christian cage especially with this character should not be presented as the father figure like, like he's the patriarchy is not a good thing Right. Uh, it, it, you know, conceptually or in the uh, version of this show here on our television. So uh, the idea that we're turning Christian Cage face questionable, that we are doing it right now for seemingly no good reason, ridiculous. If you were ever going to do it, you would do it where Christian Cage, after watching Adam Copeland get beaten within an inch of his life, finally decides that he needs to do something not devious and horrible for once in like the last five years here and comes out and saves his best friend, Adam Copeland. And we finally have the heart soaked moment where Christian turns face. I'll actually go further. This should be the only circumstance where Christian goes face because this is kind of the big buildup. You turn him face, he goes one last match, but this time for real. And then he makes a title chase retires. Like, he needs to stay heel indefinitely here. But AEW it went to the big show school of booking. I just, <laughs> I'm so fixated on you saying that. Oh, great use of Jay White when it was Phoenix who got to do absolutely nothing in that match because I think there was some CMLL guy on, on the show. So it's like, yeah, we're going to send him out there to lose in this Owen tournament, but he's not allowed to do anything. Cause we, we have people from the other promotion uh, on the show. Cause Phoenix did Jack squat against Jay white in that match. It was a Jay white squash match for the most part. Uh, he was a premier signing. The Jay white is <laughs> hard for people to remember this. He was talked about, not quite at Osprey levels when they signed him. Is he going to go to NXT or is he going to go to AEW? Yeah, kind of close. Kind of close. It was kind of a big deal that AEW got him and they Cesaroed him. Yeah. Let's uh let's get to this card and we can talk about other things within this show cuz I think everything kind of hits on there. Uh, some of these are uh, fill-ins that I didn't realize happened, but apparently happened on the taping. So uh, 13 matches on your Forbidden Door card. Three of them on the pre-show. It's going to be a jam band thing. Get ready. Strap in. Have popcorn. Use pause on your remote so you can go to the bathroom. All those and other things. And then 1.25 speed for some of these. And 1.25 speed, yes. Chris Statlander and Momo Watanabe with Stokely Hathaway versus Willow Nightingale and Tam Nakano. Watanabe and Nakano being uh, borrowed from stardom, obviously, in a tag team match. Probably happens on either Rampage or Collision. Who knows? <laughs> they were added. Chris, do the heels win or do the baby faces win? Baby faces win. I disagree. Heels win here. They're still going to build up Statlander for Statlander's pinning somebody, and then it's going to yeah, continue I, the Statlander. I still think Nakano. I think they did do, do Nakano winning here to just okay. have a feel good moment. Okay, we'll go with that. Living legend in the women's Owen Hart Cup tournament first round match: Mariah May with Tonis, to, Timeless Tony Storm, Luther, and probably Mina Shirakawa. 
versus Soraya with Harley Cameron and Anna J. Let me tell you something, Chris, in that six person match, I thought Harley Cameron and Anna J were both better than Mariah May in the ring. That's just my personal opinion. And I think we're getting Mariah May winning this damn Owen Hart Cup, which is going to be very, very interesting. So I think she wins this match. Who do I you think have? She, I think she wins. Mariah May in Wembley. Okay. We'll see how that goes. Uh, <laughs> Los Ingobernables de Japan, or Japan, or Hop, Hapon, or however you say it over there. Yoda, Suji, Teton, and Hiromu Takahashi versus... The Lucha Brothers, a Penta and Ray Phoenix, and Mystico, which blows my mind in some way. I guess because it's on the pre-show, they can do this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here going, that is an actual Forbidden Door type of match, and it's on the pre-show. Okay, uh, who do you have winning this? The Mystico team. I agree. This is gonna be this is gonna be triple A C M L L Unity weird type of Tony Tony Khan has thrown money at somebody, probably C M L L and Teton's taking the fall. That's what I think. I, I mean, I get it. Like Sin Cara was a character that connected with a lot of us growing up. <laughs> Kanosuke Takeshita versus Mark Briscoe versus Jack Perry versus Dante Martin versus Leo Rush, almost said Leo Rush, versus El Phantasmo, who I really, really like. I love El Phantasmo. Please bring him over. He's funny. In a ladder match for the vacant AEW TNT Championship, is there any chance anybody other than Jack Perry wins this thing? It's got to be Jack Perry. It was dumb to not belt Jack Perry in the first place. Agreed. Singles match for the AEW Women's World title. Timeless Tony Storm versus Mina Shirakawa in a butts versus boobs match. Um, <laughs> pretty much. Um, <laughs> no, I actually think this will be pretty good, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to it. Uh, but is there any chance that Tony that, that Mariah does not get involved and probably go off with Tony Storm in the end? Yeah, I think butts win. Butts win. I think butts win. I think it's kind of in a gray area whether or not Mariah May meant to help Tony Storm or not, but Mariah May will probably help Tony Storm and will eventually lead to their feud once she gets the uh, Owen Cup or whatever. The learning tree of Chris Jericho and Big Bill and Jeff Cobb with Brian Keith versus Sh Samoa Joe Hook and Katsuyori Shibata. Oh, Chris, when they said I, I'm bringing somebody over from Japan, I was hoping it was Toru Yano. But no. I know. <laughs> I know. It, it made me really, really upset that Jericho, especially this character, would not be enamored with the shameless self-promotion of, of Toru Yano. Yano. Yes, it fits. Yes, like that. I'm right down to there's a video sent. It should just be excerpts from the Toriyama DVD. Yes, it should be a DVD. And he should be going to his learning tree and say, see, all he he doesn't do any moves in that ring. It's, it's, it's show up, get paid, sell your merch, and leave. He is the perfect learning tree guy. He puts guys over like in, in uh, the laziest ways possible. He says that doesn't work for me, brother. That's what I want to hear Toru Yano say to somebody. But uh, I think Joe Hook and Shibata win this. I think so too. I, I I think especially with Jericho being spun off to other things, the Learning Tree guys are just there right now. Yeah, well, probably. Uh, is Keith wrestling in this or I mean, no, is... he's going to be, I think he's, well, you know what? He's selling the arm. He's selling the arm. Yeah. I, I mean, there's a chance that he could interfere on behalf of the learning tree here and try and get him the win. Yeah. Right. Cause Jericho now has that match against, uh, cause it's not uh, like you can't pin Shibata. No, you could pin Shibata. I mean, you shouldn't, but this is AEW. You know what I think happens? I think Keith interferes. And I think then that's when Minoru Suzuki comes down. Okay. And then they tease the Chris Jericho match, and Jericho gets scared, and then somehow Jeff Cobb gets pinned out of all of it. I don't know. Well, they, they beyond teased it. I mean... Well, it, yeah. Yeah, Suzuki said he's having a match against Jericho. Yeah, so why not have him show up here? That's fine. Yeah. 
in what might be the weirdest match of the night, and yet the one that I'm most intrigued by, MJF versus Hechicero. I mean, Kansas- MJF really made me absolutely compelled to see him go up against, I believe it was a comic book villain reject. God, can't wait to see that. I'd love to see Hechicero shoot. <laughs> ben MJF. I mean, he does does some such great stuff in there, but yeah, Hechicero's w- losing this match, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, just couldn't we'll, we'll get see over how MJF putting over this match as though oh, it's God. a total afterthought. And this is the stuff about MJF that I don't care for. Uh, you remember when he came back and he said it was nothing but hate and it was going to be super serious, and now all right. of a sudden he's still go- going back to the goofy stuff like three weeks afterwards. God. He- I know there's no consistency in the character. All of the promos are baggy. Not everything needs to be written out note for note, but like it feels as though when we get promos on AEW television, there's almost no bullet points. It's more like a quick rejoinder before they go through the curtain of, Hey, just remember like at the end of the promo, just remember you've got a match against Hetrocero on august 30th so just if you could try to get that over uh, but go out there you got 10 minutes have a good time out there all right both he and will osprey breaking the fourth wall is what drove me nuts I oh just, yeah well <laughs> no, look uh, i mean who who doesn't want to see one pump willie go into matches now oh god uh zach saber jr versus orange cassidy it'll be fun I don't care who wins. Um, Zack Sabre Jr. I, probably. Right. I, I guess that's really the big point. I don't care. Yeah, it's not that I'm, big I, of a blood I, feud. It's, it's a I, match. Right? It's a match people want to see. So, right? okay, great. And that, and, and that is always a problem a little bit with Zack Sabre Jr. is he's just a bit vanilla of a character. And when you pair that with his dance-like style of grapple technician stuff it makes for these very wonderfully executed and totally bloodless sort of matches yes and this is going to be kind of his slightly bloodless style with a completely heatless match i'm gonna say orange cast wins but i don't care okay for the IWGP World Heavyweight title, John Moxley, the champion, versus Tetsuya Naito. We'll see how motivated Naito is in this one, uh, but he's winning it, and he's taking the title back with him to Japan. Yeah, agree. In a match that I am very interested in, this is the match I'm interested in most on this card. Mercedes Monet versus Stephanie Vaquer, winner-take-all match for the TBS title and the New Japan Strong Women's Championship. First match was pretty good. I kind of dig Stephanie Vacare's vibe a little bit. Um, and I think Mercedes is motivated. I, I, I am, I'm looking forward to this. I think Mercedes obviously wins this. Uh, and that's why Moxley is going to be doing the honors for Nido earlier in the night so that, Hey, we can have a little bit of corporate synergy here. I think Monet wants to go back, defend that strong title on a new Japan card in the, in the, uh, in the Tokyo dome. But I think this is going to be kind of a banger of a match. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I agree with all those sentiments. I, I think it's uh, obvious that Mercedes is on a victory train right now. She's going to keep winning. And I, it doesn't seem like she's about to hit any resistance anytime soon. And this is definitely not the point where she's taking a loss. The elite of Matt Jackson, Nick Jackson, and Okada versus the versus Scissor Ace, Anthony Bowens, Max Caster, and Hiroshi Tanahashi. Those of you who complain about Nakamura just being in Orlando to surf because he enjoys surfing and he's taking it too light, owe him an apology because of what Okada and Tanahashi are going to do in this match, which is very little, to be honest with you, I think. Um, uh, do, does Scissor Ace get the get the feel-good moment here? Or do I the think, elite? Yeah, I think, I think Scissor Ace gets the feel good moment here because we haven't built to the tag title match yet. And we need to heat up the potential that the acclaim actually have a chance against yes. the elite right now. And the crowd's not biting on this. And it didn't help when Billy Gunn was like, I could kick all three of your asses by myself. But instead, <laughs> I'm going to have. 
the people on this show routinely say things that are deeply sabotaging to other stuff that goes on. And you're like, why? How? Uh, you're Billy Gunn. You should have I never had like great promo instincts, but you should have better instincts than that. Or you should be punished for saying these things. Right. Stop screwing up our stories, 60 something year old Billy Gunn. Jeez. I, yeah, I, I, I had forgotten about that, but you're correct. Men's Owen Hart Cup tournament first round match. Brian Danielson, Vanity Tour. Brian Danielson versus Shingo Takagi. Danielson wins. Danielson wins. And then in in what is going to be some booking intrigue, but probably not, Swerve Strickland versus Will Ospreay for the AEW world title. I had said last week that if the number was a really bad one, that Tony would entertain putting the belt on Ospreay. Despite all the backlash he would get online, on Twitter, for various political reasons. Chris, is there any chance, any, that they still that they go through with putting the title on Will Ospreay? Oh, God, what a mistake. So all of those political, social, et cetera, reasons, and as I mentioned last week on the Juneteenth episode where Swerve Strickland also talked about going after Will Ospreay's kids, that maybe the characterization on this has not been an absolute banger the whole way down. I, I am going to say that trying to put the belt on Will Ospreay when he has come off as likable but unsympathetic at best leading into this into this build and I would even go so far as to say slightly annoying actually they times. went back to that week one characterization where he was like Maverick from Top Gun the cocky guy who's grabbing the belt and looking at the belt type thing right and last week he was family man don't you say yes. stuff about my kids yes I just it, it, Right. It, the characterization has been really all over the place, which is why I presented the bifurcated choose your adventure with Will Ospreay thing earlier. Because in the main event, we had Swerve Strickland establishing that he was willing to do the evil and dastardly things that it takes to be a champion in his own estimations, which includes using violence even when others think it is overwhelming or uncalled for, basically going above and beyond defeat on your opponents. And again, juxtapose that against the hero presentation that we've tried to do with Strickland at various points. I find that a confusing message. But then I also found it very confusing that Osprey's like, Ugh, oh my God, oh, and, oh. Ah, he did the thing he did the arm. I guess I'll hit the finishing move. This is too much for me. And then he grabs the belt at the end of that. Like, what is that <laughs> in terms of characterization? Like, oh, I'm scared of this guy. He could hurt me To, I'm not scared of you. I'll pick your pocket. Like, is Will Ospreay an idiot? It is, what is this? What is this characterization? No, Osprey, all of this is to say, no, Osprey is not winning this title. And no, with the way they have handled Will Osprey since they've gotten him to now, Osprey should not win this title anytime soon. This should be the end of the Osprey story until they figure out what the Osprey story is. And that's pathetic. I, I I don't think Swerve loses it here either. I just I just can't see that. Uh, so let's close the door on the Forbidden Door. Go over to the uh, Stamford area company. Uh, main roster. The the only thing we're talking about on Raw, I think, in terms of what your was your opinion, was that Uncle Howdy segment slash. Oh boy, I liked it. Did you? I, okay. I, yeah, it talked back into the room. Uh, I think Bo is going to be very very good as a character Bo uh, has I, acting chops i will give yeah, him that i yeah. think i think my issue with it and mcafee was off because his father-in-law died not not for any other not for uh in angle reason but oh you, i don't know about that i think there's gonna well, no, no. Be an, well yeah, there's I going think, to be they, they've been yeah, teasing it on yeah. the show but i'm just yes. saying from this week 
it was in Indianapolis and they didn't, they did it. McAfee wasn't on the show because his father-in-law died. It wasn't because of right. Miss, right, right, right. Miss stunk up the joint on, on commentary, but nevertheless, Although I, I did, the Miz being on commentary did actually lead to a really nice piece of storytelling in terms of getting the belts off of yes, them. Yes, yeah. That like it, it put Miz in a place, and he had to watch it abject horror as his friend, a member of the Judgment Day, our truth, was bamboozled by the internal politics <laughs> of this group. Um, I I liked the Bo Dallas part. I didn't oh, like good. I didn't like the Nikki Cross part. With the no. with the VHS tape, it's like ah, oh, you do the, you do such great work there, to then go into the dumb spooky theme park crap. It's like no, keep it on the kind of the creepy stuff, the edgy stuff that could be real, could be not, where he's kind of talking to himself and having doubts type of a thing. That makes it's more I interesting than a talking be there, bird. Jeff. Yeah, I I think the writing's gonna be there. Uh, that even just that little line about, do you feel like you're exploiting your brother's legacy? Like that was a good line. It was a good line. And and it was a great moment of TV. I'm with you, Nikki cross, all the other stuff uh, of the Wyatt verse doesn't really do it for me, but Chad Gable coming out. I'm okay. It's like, no, (laughs) Uh, I don't think he is though. He's in denial. Uh, (laughs) Right. Shot in the head, Chris. Right. Right. He he was shot in the head. You he's think he's in okay, denial? <laughs> yes. He he's ha- okay. A lot of times after people get shot in the head, they win their next match. Oh. But eventually it catches up with them. So it, it, no, it, like, it's this long-term storytelling. Uh, oh, so anyways. I was so I, mad at that. I was so mad that he came out and goes, rumors of my demise are greatly exaggerated. No, uh, no. I, I now back in the let's see where this is going camp and you know I hate being is Canny camp. coming out is Canny let's see how this I, plays out le, le, can, my boy Canny is speaking louder it's funny I don't hear his voice as much ever since I stopped drinking yeah but uh, <laughs> it, it, right now he's louder he's as loud as he's been in over oh. six months oh, uh, yes. I do I do in fact hear the voice of canny saying let's see how this plays out because i think bo dallas is strong enough that it makes it worth it i, okay. I think with chad gable what uh, we're getting a tease that he's going to recruit the uh the uh, uh creeds the creeds but they're not i i think that's that's a red herring he's gonna he's be a talking still- turtle no, he's gonna get sucked. He's gonna get sucked in into Wyatt the, Six. Into yeah. the Wyatt Six, exactly. Yeah, what animal is he gonna be? He's gonna be a turtle. He's gonna be I, I, right. Chad oh, Gable the turtle. And I also think the storytelling with McAfee, now that I'm starting to see it come together, makes so much sense. They did a really good job with this. Where Cole's always like, "Oh, that thing's weird," and then every week McAfee's like, "Yeah, I, w- I went back to my room and, and I was watching it." And like we, and then we kind of move past it in the show. But if you actually think about like the McAfee character off screen, imagine him in the hotel room, at like twelve in the morning, still watching the weird video from the Wyatts. You know, like scanning the <laughs> QR code. He's been getting red pilled essentially. He's going to be conspiracy minded Pat right. McAfee. Like, right, like the, right. It's always sunny go. meme where he has like a, a board and like thread. Although, yeah. Okay. I'll it, no, it. It, right. This is the thing though that I really enjoy about the raw universe now. And this is also true of the SmackDown universe, but I feel like raw, like SmackDown's really established that with the bloodline and then has kind of worked it out from there. Whereas <laughs> it feels like with raw, it went, when they figured out what they were doing with the judgment day, it's like a lot of other pieces started to fit together around this puzzle. And you, you get these characters that have been built over weeks and months who now have these motivations where if you stop and you think like, Oh, what, why is this person doing that or whatever? Um, it's very entertaining. Uh, an, another great moment of this, this week was, the Dominic Mysterio segment where he's in the ring trying to break up Liv Morgan and Zelina Vega and has the interaction with Ray where he like pushes over Ray and then later backstage because he was originally out there to stop Liv uh, later backstage when Liv goes up to him he's always like I, I hate my dad he's a deadbeat but <laughs> then, then we we circle back to Ray Mysterio as deadbeat dad yeah 
Um, Drew McIntyre, same thing. We've been telling a story for weeks and weeks with him. Uh, Braun Breaker, same idea. We've been telling a story for weeks and weeks about this guy and the way that he rubs everybody the wrong way. Uh, I, I mean, I think he comes up short in this match against Sami Zayn because he's pissed too many people off. Hmm. Chris, how many combined tickets in Canada do you think that Sean Spears and Ethan Page are selling for NXT Heat Wave as Canadian attractions? And is the over under zero on that? Oh, God, I was going to say upwards of a good. I mean, are they in either Two? one of their hometowns? Uh, I don't believe either are from Toronto proper, which is okay. the, the site of the next NXT. Well, I understand this. They to one of their hometowns. Could like either one of them pay to bus in some friends? I believe Sean Spears is Calgary, and I believe that uh, Ethan Page is Edmonton, but don't quote me on that. Well, I'm could just... one of them make a call to Bret Hart and see if <laughs> Bret Hart would show up at that. Well, no, Bret Hart's showing up to, to Dax Harwood's 40th birthday in North Carolina. So, so <laughs> I don't think so he's... Bret's not available. My point is, this is going to be a four-way, I think, for Trick Williams' title. And I like Sean Spears, and I like Ethan Page. I don't like either of them beating Javon Evans and Trick Williams over and over and over again to lead to a four-way where they don't really matter, and one of them's taking the pin, and you don't think either of them are going to win this title, et cetera, et cetera. Why? It's, it's, the, it's the Daniel Garcia problem, from which I was saying, if you're going to push young guys, push young guys. Let's do this. Let's go all the way with it. If you're afraid they can't work, then you put them in with the veteran guys and you give the title to the veteran and you let him chase for a while, which is what they should have done less. Now we're going to have a four-way where we have two guys who we don't trust to have a one-on-one -on -one match in terms of Trick Williams and Javon Ed Evans. Oh, but we need to put them in with these ring generals of, of Ethan Page and, and Sean Spears to work them through. But now you've also now made the the degree of difficulty exponential by having a four-way we're, we're gonna have a lot of set pieces and people need to be in the right place instead of just having a match where people tell a story one-on-one -on -one. i'm i'm livid at this nxt because they built up such good goodwill with us over the week like the one thing that popped me on nxt was ariana grace and her shenanigans before the match when sol ruka was coming in she's perfect can't wait to see her with Chelsea Green on the main roster. I, I, I <laughs> she, she's a great comedy figure, but everything else on this show, I hated. I, I, I don't want Damon Kemp breaking up with the no quarter catch crew to, to, because Tavion Heights is the quote unquote new guy and splitting them up. We're, we're just making no sense with a lot of the booking on this show for me, Chris. Yeah, I, I, I feel, I feel the same way. I, I don't care for booking on this look ethan page should be the champion right now i think the best case scenario is that our four-way main event at takeover is actually a set piece where sean spears and ethan page are actually in cahoots and they get the belt on ethan page but that does not excuse the idiotic booking of javon evans what is the point of giving him these high profile wins only for him to have them erased either by the booking patterns or by his own stupid decisions? So I don't know what that says about him. Trick Williams remains a weak champion. There's just new two ways around it. He's not strong on the mic. He doesn't have a strong look and he's not strong in the ring. And Sean Spears no one takes him seriously as a title contender. So him and Evans really feel like two guys who are just there. This is subtraction by addition into the storyline. This is a very basic story to me of Ethan Page is here. He hates Trick Williams, doesn't think the guy's a worthy champion. Trick Williams is trying to prove that he's a worthy champion. Either he does or he does but gets screwed and loses the title these are the two stories that you should be telling and you're not telling them with with these guys here uh i i think uh uh kalani jordan's promo style is very strange and 
I can't tell if she's a face or a heel in certain ways. It's very scripted, and she's not doing well with the scripting, but she's a baby face. Yeah. Um, Lola, I think they at least made the back fist spot make more sense on this week's television, so I'll give them that. Still was not a great spot last week. Uh, and also, I kind of think she should beat Roxanne here. Uh, well, let's see how they do the go home. And then I'll be yeah. able to decide whether or not what they're doing. We'll, we'll do a preview of that next week. Uh, uh, Damon Kemp and Tavian Heights was like fine. Like the exchanges were good, but I, I don't necessarily, I'm with you. I don't, I don't like what they're doing with no quarter catch crew at and all. I at hate all. It. I hate it. Like, pretty much top. It's, they are the opposite of the judgment day where you theoretically have all the pieces there in terms of entertainment uh, and wrestling quality and all the characters are absolutely terrible. Yes. Um, Oba Femi's also running out of steam. Like the one promo that he does of like, I am a mighty champion. Like that is basically his promo every single time. And well, I, we're running in place with who he's feuding with because yeah. Okay, we're gonna bring back Wesley, but we still have Joe Coffey in the mix. It's I think Joe Coffey is gonna screw Wesley in this last chance match. And, and then we're just going to be back in step one because they're afraid of what to do with Obafemi because they don't really know what to do with Obafemi, I think. And yeah, right. And he's not really dominating anyone. I mean, it really, this should be a scenario where Obafemi decides, he decides for himself he just wants to face Wes Lee and the way he's going to do that is just by beating the crap out of all the Gallus guys. Basically, like, three-on-one handicap match and he wins. Yeah. Uh, yeah, th- that, that should be... And that should be the build for Wesley going into the takeover event here is that Femi took care of the other opponent, all three of them. What is Wesley going to do? Let's end with Vader Club. Introduce us to your choice here, Chris. All righty. So I chose a man who is a mainstay on Virtual Pro Wrestling 2 and my Virtual Pro Wrestling 2 character, Dr. No has had many a match against him. One, Gary Albright. Uh, He shows up a lot of times in in my tag team struggles, too, with Vader, Uh, often on the (laughs) BBW games. If I was going to have a tag team partner, who else would it be? Also, I'd manage Vader, like, clearly. I'd be like his kind of crappy tag team partner who gets beat up, and then Vader comes in and saves my butt. Anyways, the match that we watched was... Toshiaki Kawada, Eddie Kingston's favorite wrestler, versus Gary Albright from October 25th, 1995, rated by none other than the great Dave Meltzer at 4.25 stars. It is, in my opinion, 15 minutes of pure bliss, and I think it serves as a really nice distillation of the difference between strong style, like we get on TV these days, and King's Road style, of the 1990s where everything looks like it effing hurts probably because it does but it's not (laughs) as heavily it's not a heavy emphasis on no selling if anything one of the highlights of this match for me um from both albright and kawada were in the quality of the cells uh you had really great selling of the limbs uh, both of them had to sell shoulder and or arm damage at various points, took a powder to the outside of the ring, had to recollect themselves. At one point, Gary Albright hits Kawada with just an incredible German suplex, uh, folds him up like an accordion, uh, and Kawada gets up like he is doing the strong style no-sell, and then like a super punch-out character stumbles out of the ring in his dizzy spin and ends up in a heap on the floor. It is so masterfully done. Chris, Chris, can, Chris can, Chris can, uh, can, uh, can, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Vouch I, for this. Uh, I popped hard for that cell. So, cause we were watching it together. I just, I just absolutely lost my mind on, on that cell, even though I've seen people do similar ones, the way that Kawada did it looked real. And I, I just absolutely adored it. Yeah. It, it served as a testimony to the importance of selling to get offense over for a fan base like that strong selling 
the strong style selling doesn't actually as effectively get over how murderous a suplex is yes. or how murderous an enziguri is as does an attempted strong sell that results in an actual sell that, that much much more effective and that actual sells always trump strong style sells in my opinion no matter what um kawada of course if you are familiar with this work does all of his great stiff 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 ass kicks and then murder also, kicks those are just and, murder kicks and then talking about the man gary albright here gary albright showing up to this match clearly at his college weight I am being extremely facetious here. Gary Albright seems to be about plus 40 pounds, and they all appear to be in his midsection, leading to a very interesting sort of body shape on the guy that actually lends to his weird grappling menace. Yeah. That this guy has really long and gangly limbs, clearly has a wrestler's body underneath there, and now has this very formidable center of mass with which he can toss you around from. And Gary Albright uses that a lot. I think he does lots of great leverage moves throughout here. A lot of his reverses to get to the back grapple are really nicely done. And I enjoy that Albright does a combination. Uh, like, he is primarily a wrestler. But there's this part of him that wants to brawl. But every time he tries to do that against Kawada, he sorely regrets it because Kawada is actually a brawler who does some occasional wrestling and submissions. And that st story of the styles is told throughout the match. And there's a part of him that wants to be a judoku or a judoka or whatever you say. Because yeah. he, he likes doing his throws. He loves his little leverage throws. Uh, the spot that we also really, really liked, and it's something that a lot of – like the full Nelson spot when he's on the ground and yes. you're using the leverage there. Like when, when American companies put, give a guy with the full Nelson, there's no real violence to it. I mean, it, it's a strength spot. Like you had masters and Lashley do it. The, the most I've seen somebody be really violent, like Billy Jack Haynes used to like put on the full Nelson and shake you around kind of a thing, but you were never on the ground getting rubbed your face rubbed in the mat with, with, with a full Nelson, like, like Gary Albright did here. And it was friggin' awesome. And, and it, it really like, like when you watch 80 squash matches, like you, you get a lot of the, okay, here's a guy who can grapple, but he's also screwing with a young kid and rubbing his face in the mat type of a thing. That That's what this was like for me. Yeah. So if you go back to the classic Vince notes about submission holds, the reason we never get, this type of full Nelson, it would, it would directly fly in the face of the Vince rule of we must always see your face when you're in yes. a submission hold. Yes. But the whole point of this submission hold to me, it actually what gets over the agony and the demoralization of it is you just see dude hands behind head just staring at the mat. No hope. It's just an ocean of canvas between you and the ropes. And you're in the middle of the ring on your belly, complete loss of the arms. Mm -hmm. And you have a guy like Gary Albright carrying that extra weight, just putting it all straight on your back. There is a real level of hopelessness to the, the trapped nature uh, of, of this type of hold that uh, I do think is, uh, is sorely missed. I, I this is a really good match. It's not long. Uh, I mean, it, it's 15 minutes, so it's not short, but it's not like 45 minutes in the Tokyo Dome or anything right. like that. It, it is real. It, it's just good. And, and I also love, initially, they're kind of respecting each other's powder breaks, but I like where the respect for the powder breaks breaks down. And like Albright goes out and just like rams over Kawada. And then later Kawada like sees Albright favor the shoulders, like, cool. Just kicks, kicks him right in the shoulder. Just yeah. kicks him right in the shoulder. Yeah, uh, I think next week, Vader Club, I'm gonna rewatch this and then I'll confirm to you. But I'm thinking it's gonna be Benoit Malenko versus the Tasmaniac and Sabu from Return of the Funker. ECW uh, I think that's uh, 1995. I'll send you a link for it. Uh, so uh, so watch that in anticipation, kids. If it's as good as I remember it, uh, we'll be watching that. 
It's been Shake Them Ropes. I am Jeff Hawkins. You can follow me on the socials at Crap Game 13. You can just follow the show at Shake Them Ropes, all one word. If you want to follow Chris on his one social thing, it's only Instagram at D O C T O R underscore N O V. We are part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network podcast for all of your niche wrestling loves. I also work for Fight Game Media. I do a show called The Dynamite Show. Wednesday nights, about 20 minutes afterwards, Paul Fontaine and myself go live, deconstruct all things AEW, drops in your podcatchers the next morning. Chris has various interests, and he will teach you music if you so incline. Yeah, if you like music, I like music. I'm actually doing a lecture on the post-punk band Wire this Sunday. It is starting at 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. Uh, That is uh 1 p.m on the east coast and 10 a.m on the west coast i was told there'd be no math chris but yes <laughs> there's always math the whole world in its way is made up of numbers as is music and we'll be discussing all of that in this week's lecture on wire focusing in on pink flag and chairs missing if you are interested in guitar lessons i'm interested in teaching them so please hit me up on the Instagram if you are so moved, so inclined. It is kind of what I am doing these days. And other than that, I just want to remind everyone that you need to get your oil checked every 3,000 miles if you're using regular, but every 5,000 if you're using synthetic. But when summer comes around, always a good time to check your oil. It's hot out there, people. Let's take care of our autos. And hot weather will kill your battery. So check that too. And it'll kill you. <laughs>